The sixth issue is um, looking at biennials. Um, we reviewed in the um, um, issue the uh, Paris Triennial. Um, and um, also, one of the sections that appears, reappears in each of the issues is the section called typologies. And typologies looks into different types of exhibitions. In the first issue, we started with the solo exhibition. We moved on to the retrospective art in public space. Um, group exhibitions, and for this issue, we uh, put a special focus on biennials. So I thought it would be interesting to uh, speak a little bit with Massimiliano Gioni uh, about biennials um, and about uh, different formats of biennials, about the idea of rethinking biennials, also in the light of uh, the opening of Manifesta, the Berlin Biennial, and uh, Documenta in the last couple of months. Um, and. <clears throat> Massimiliano has uh, curated, as I said, a number of biennials. He was one of the curators of the Venice Biennial in 2002, uh, when Francesco Bonami was the artistic director, curated with Massim um, Maurizio Catalan and Ali Subotnik the uh, Berlin Biennial, as well as uh, Manifesta. Um, <clears throat> and I think also where we collaborated once on was the, <laughs> the very first Tirana Biennial, which was uh, we had to share the, uh, the a hotel. very lovely hotel room in Tirana. <laughs> All they had to drink was Red Bull and vodka. <laughs> anyway, um, so you have been working on a lot of different biennials, and I wonder how sort of you think um, the development of, of that particular exhibition format and type of exhibition has sort of unfolded itself over the last uh, uh, few uh, decades. Well. Uh the, the question of biennial is, of course, one of the crucial ones in uh, uh, recent years, particularly after their explosion, I would say, from the 90s onwards, when uh, biennials became the, the sort of privileged format of contemporary art. Uh, so it's a, it's a matter that it's quite complicated and quite large. It would probably take two years <laughs> to, <laughs> to talk about the question of biennials. I, I am, unlike many uh, Colleagues, I am of course a fan of biennials, uh, not only because uh, I have had the chance of doing a few, but because I think they are um, usually quite open uh, formats, and uh, because you are hired usually to do only one biennial, and uh, the the institution itself it's often quite um, open to change much more than museums and much more than collections so i think uh, also for people uh, uh, that have uh, egotic ambitions like many <laughs> curators do it's uh, the the best job you can get because he allows um, the director or the curator to really take care of the entire vision from the exhibition to to its communication and uh, uh, so on also i think that since uh, we have now so many biennials in the world, something quite interesting has happened that um, what was a format now is just a word. I think that at this point we have so many biennials, so many different kinds of biennials have been executed, like uh, just to, to, to uh, mention the three that you just um, spoke about, like the Berlin Biennale Manifesta and Documenta. Uh, they, these three cases, they, they exemplify uh, very different approaches to biennials. And in the world now, there are so many biennials and so many uh, different ways of doing it that, in a way, the definition of biennial has uh, become so open that that allows the curators, I think, to actually just enjoy them and not be uh, problematizing what a biennial really is. I think uh, that's also what. Uh, personally I've been sort of going through and understanding can we move away from the question, from a sort of meta-linguistic question of what a biennial should be and just uh, take advantage of the biennial as an occasion to make a show you wouldn't be able to make anywhere else uh, because now um, I think biennials of a certain scale particularly allow you to, to realize exhibitions that no other museums uh, in the world could allow you to do. So um, I don't know if that's yeah. just too random or touches. No, no, I think this is a good way of beginning the conversation. And I wanted to just go back to the uh, three articles that are in uh, the um, latest issue of The Exhibitionist, um, where the three writers, um, Juan Ru, Nancy Adarjani, and Adriano Petros, are each sort of like look at a different, uh, uh, in a different way at the biennial. And one of the things that um, come out is that um, 
there's still somehow this idea that the biennial always has to be this large scale international group exhibition. If you would sort of condense it to like all the, 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 all the characteristics of the biennial like down to like three points, it's international, it's, it's, it's global, and usually it has to sort of showcase emerging art. Do you think that is still longer uh, sort of like a basic um, way of identifying what a biennial is about? And is that still longer interesting? Well, given the fact um, that there's so many of yeah, them? Yeah, it's a good question. And uh, I mean, from my point of view, I can say that, yes, it's interesting for me to think of a biennial, as, a, as I just say, as a place where you articulate a large scale exhibition that is often international. I think um, throughout the years, we have seen a, a dramatic change of also what international means, uh, both because on the one hand, the game has become bigger and there are many more participants. On the other, I think there has been a transition from an idea of globalization as um, a sort of gathering of happy people coming together, a sort of united colors of Benetton model that was uh, very much the myth of the 90s, to now an idea uh, maybe of internationalism that it's more conflictual, like for example is seen in the Berlin Biennale uh, or in many other, uh, even in documenta where uh, usually uh, the discussion is about art being related to two areas of war or areas of trauma. Um, I think other Bayanas have uh, tried also to break down the unity like you did in, uh, in Istanbul, and maybe you want to talk about that of conceiving an exhibition that it's in a way a show of shows. And, uh, and also, again, you mentioned that the 2003 Venice Biennale that Francesco Bonami organized that was based on a similar model of uh, uh, an exhibition that was constructed by many different uh, shows. I think that um, just this morning I was reading the review of uh, Documenta in the New York Times, and actually the, the final sentence sort of criticized this uh, uh, myth of the curator that is still very uh, prominent today as a person who uh, thinks that he or she holds the truth and can actually see art um, everywhere and at the same time. And I think, uh, I mean, because it's my job, I cannot give away. With <laughs> I don't want to fire myself. But I also think it's, uh, um, yes, it's maybe also time to question <coughs> the idea of the omni uh, the, the curator is somebody who can see everything and uh, uh, can even master knowledge from uh, Afghani sculpture to contemporary art. I, so and maybe a way to do it is by um, sort of breaking down the unity of the exhibition. But maybe that's something you want to talk about. Well, I think that I don't know how, how, how it was in your cases when you were working on, on biennials, but one of the things that Adriano Petrosa and I were very concerned about when we curated the Istanbul Biennial last year was to really think about the history of the Istanbul Biennial. Uh, and, and also you know, looking what other biennials were doing approximately at the same time as we were putting together our exhibition. So we tried to f come up with a different format. I think it was like a, a proposal for a different structure of a, of a biennial and, and, and dividing the entire biennial into five different exhibitions um, that we both then co-curated in contrast to what Massimiliano was saying about the 2003 Venice Biennial where Francesco Bonami invited, I think, probably about 10 other curators. Um, what was interesting in Francesco's case was that at that particular point in 2003, the uh, Venice Biennial got extremely negative reactions. But now, uh, with uh, a decade past, all of a sudden, the 2003 Venice Biennial is actually being um, reconsidered, and, and uh, a lot of um, um, cu curators and also art historians sort of look back at this as an interesting moment in the development of curatorial practice and exhibition making, simply because it was very much a, a, um, a moment when a lot of ideas that I think came out of a history of independent curating came together in one uh, big exhibition. Also a certain generation of curators that uh, emerged in the 1990s. It was almost like a summary of all these sort of like ideas and practices. And you were you know, one of the younger curators, or actually the youngest curator within that uh, group um, back then. Another thing that I wanted to um, ask you about, which Adriano Petrosa mentions in his text, is uh, 
the um, appearance of biennials within inside museums or that are organized by museums. Uh, the Venice Biennial is uh, organized by a foundation, the Istanbul Biennial is organized by a foundation, and Documenta has uh, the, the foundation that organizes this. But there's also uh, a biennials, as, as you know, that are organized by specific museums. And I think the best example of that is probably uh, the Whitney Biennial or perhaps the Carnegie International, which is not happening every two years, but sort of could con be considered within the same uh, group of exhibitions. Now, the new museum um, that uh, Massimiliano is running together with Lisa Phillips uh, inaugurated uh, what is called the uh, generational uh, triennial um, that um, just took place this year. And um, also, and perhaps related to that, uh, a couple of months ago, maybe a month ago, um, the Hammer Museum in Los Angeles, together with uh, um, LAX Art, um, launched the um, uh, Los Angeles Biennial, which is called Made in LA. Um, and I'm wondering, where do you think these sort of like latest um, desires come from to create a biennial that is sort of within an institution and a very specific focus? In your case, it's a focus on young and emerging artists. And in the Los Angeles uh, Biennial Made in LA, it's a focus on yes. art made in Los Angeles. Yeah, actually, I want to go back to what you were saying first about the, the 2003 edition of the Venice Biennial being reevaluated. That seems to be also a, a typical uh, sort of uh, destiny for many biennials that they're usually hated when they happen and then reevaluated. Uh, I've been doing a lot of research on the 1993 biennial, for example, which uh, within the industry has become a sort of legendary exhibition because it was the, the sort of first global uh, Venice Biennale in which uh, also many artists emerged. And, uh, and if you read the reviews of the time, uh, they, they were incredibly negative. The, the New York Times, the title was Death in Venice. And, um, Death in Venice. Death in Venice. <laughs> so I think that's all simply to say that probably um, it's better to do always the next biennial so that the previous one looks better. <laughs> anyway, now to answer the question about museums um, organizing biennial cities, somehow a very American phenomenon. I can think maybe Sao Paulo. But it's not, not a museum exactly. either, it's yeah. also a foundation. Um, yeah. So it's a very American um, <laughs> model. I think it's a model that emerged from what uh, back in the days used to be called the Invitational. Mm. Uh, so these museums like the Whitney would do every year, uh, at the beginning of every year, they would make an Invitational exhibition. And, uh, and out of this model came uh, the Biennial, like the Whitney Biennial. Um, in our case, in the case of the new museum, uh, he even had a, a strange evolution because actually um, the original idea for the show about the generation born around 1980 uh, was just, which was the first um, installment of the, the new museum triennial. Uh, anyway, the idea for that show was just an idea of an exhibition. And then somehow we gather so much momentum within uh, the institution and Mm, that it became a triennial. And I think what happened was, particularly Lisa Phillips, because used to, uh, she used to work at the Whitney, I think she saw the opportunity for a new recurring show in New York, uh, and um, particularly in a city where there is no recurring international exhibition. New York has Greater New York, and the Whitney Biennial, and nine, neither of them are uh, international. So I think she saw there was a, a niche in a way and occupied it right away, which I think is also interesting uh, because for all the criticism also around the word biennial or triennial, there is nothing like those words uh, to capture the attention of the audience, to, to uh, also uh, talk to people who are outside the art world. Uh, uh, it, it was quite instructive for me to see, for example, how uh, the difference between a regular show and a show that it's called Triennial, uh, in terms of audience, it immediately multiplied it by, I think, five times or three times. And uh, in fact, the budget wasn't different from a regular show. The concept <laughs> wasn't different. Uh, but uh, the idea that we were starting a new recurring exhibition gave an incredible boost to it. And I think that's also why uh, throughout the 90s, many administrations of cities and so on, they jumped on the idea 
uh, of the biennial, and, and that's why so many biennials happen all over the world. Today, and I always say this in panels about biennials, which are more frequent than biennials themselves. <laughs> uh, unfortunately, or fortunately, today the, uh, the new magic word for administration has been the fair. Uh, and uh, on many levels, we could say that if the 90s were the decade of the biennial, these first 10 years have become suddenly the, uh, the decade of the art fair, with all also the, the distortions that both models bring with them. So maybe the next exhibition is, will be about fairs. The topology <laughs> of the fair. Well, the um, other interesting thing that um, maybe relates to what you said about the, ex uh, the biennials and trains in places like New York is that um, many of the biennials, I think, that, that um, have become sort of like historical points of reference, like the Johannesburg Biennial or Istanbul Biennial, have uh, taken place in the periphery rather than in the center. So now there is a sort of moment when the biennial returns to the center. And what I don't understand fully is why would a city like Los Angeles or uh, New York need an exhibition like that, um, given that there's already so many museums, given that there's already so many galleries, that the uh, biennial makes sense in a place like Sao Paulo or um, Istanbul, where there isn't really an infrastructure of museums and galleries, makes a lot of sense to me. Yeah. What do you think well, about this uh, idea? Um, First of all, being the Venice Biennial, the first Biennial, uh, it's interesting to look back at its history because when uh, the Venice Biennial was created, Venice was certainly not a center, <laughs> or at well, least it was not a center really. of contemporary art. I mean, uh, there was tourism and uh, it was, and it is a beautiful city, but <coughs> the mayor of Venice felt that there was a need and a, an opportunity to bring contemporary culture to a city that was becoming more and more uh, even oppressed by its past. Um, of course, the model uh, behind the Biennial is the, the International Expo, and uh, so it's also nice that you have uh, the Crystal Palace on the cover. Uh, so, and, and the International Expo, of course, comes out also of a tradition of colonialism and with the idea of bringing to the center uh, the products of the colonies and to, to, to reconstruct within a building a sort of picture of the world. And, uh, and so, of course, even in its very uh, foundation, the idea of the Biennial as a sort of complex relationship to the theme of the center and the theme of the periphery. And in fact, the proliferation of biennials in the 90s went uh, hand in hand with uh, an emergence of um, new artists and new participants from uh, different geographies. And, uh, and Johannesburg was a great example, or Shanghai, the biennial that now you are working on. Um, and in many of these places, the biennial have had the function of, uh, uh, yes, supplanting the institution. And, uh, um, and of course, that has created a plurality of voices that it's, uh, uh, it's very exciting. I, I still think that um, in New York, for example, going back to, to what we're saying about biennials in institutions, one thing that makes uh, uh, the Whitney Biennial special, I think, is the fact that um, it's one of the few cases, or the Carnegie, in which a biennial also acquires works. Mm -hmm. uh, which uh, biennials are incredibly powerful, energetic explosions, uh, but uh, unfortunately, they are not very good at cultivating their own memory. For example, uh, every time I look back also at the shows I've done in biennials, or I look at archives uh, of various biennials, it breaks my heart to see that, you know. Some might spend two, three millions on a show, and then by the time the show opens, you're completely out of money, and usually what happens is you don't have enough money to photograph the show. So if you, no, I don't know if you had the similar experience. <laughs> like if you try to look for photographs, uh, probably of the first Istanbul Biennial, I'm sure there is not a complete. Not many, uh, no. and, and the same for uh, endless numbers of uh, international biennials, because every, energy is put towards creating uh, a picture of the present that then the very institution forgets to, to uh, in a way, memorialize or document its own history. Uh, a place like the Whitney Biennial is quite different because it's within a museum, and so it's a rare case in which uh, um, a biennial also acquires works uh, from the show, and, and so there is also a, a, a memory um, that, in the case of the Carnegie, uh, 
spans almost now 100 years, and I think that's, uh, um, that's an interesting perspective that no other biennials um, can have, and, and that's quite valuable. So. Well, since we're in the context of an art fair, maybe it's interesting to go back to uh, what you mentioned in terms of uh, the first uh, 10 years of uh, the, the, this millennium being the uh, decade of the art fair. Um, when we started working, the art fair wasn't actually that prominent. Uh, to the no. degree it is now, no. No? and, yeah. and um, I remember teaching at Goldsmiths College, where I was teaching for four years at the curatorial program, and um, giving a class on the history of documenta. And at the first session, and um, one of the students really sort of saying, "Okay, so I get what documenta is. It's basically like the Freeze Art Fair." <laughs> and I. At, the mo at that moment, I was thinking that the student was uh, making an interesting comment about how uh, you know, these international big biennial exhibitions have also become marketplaces and how they you know, present display commodities, if you will. Uh, but then I actually realized, no, this is a different generation that has a completely different f uh, frame of reference and that, that was introduced to art, to contemporary art, more through an art fair or the gallery system um, unlike perhaps my generation now being in my late 30s, um, who that was introduced to art through museums and, and yeah. things like Documenta or the Venice Biennial. Well, I think, uh, for example, for, I mean, the generational discourse is always a little embarrassing, but I think for uh, our generation, uh, the Arco art fair in Spain uh, was somehow influential because, uh, I don't know, a, why, but they started having these uh, curators' roundtables that I yeah. think were uh, quite important to bring people together. And I think if you look back really in these 10 years, there has been a, a, a dialogue and a, a sort of, a, the, the fair has been uh, quite, the, the art fairs have been quite uh, uh, quick at sort of assimilating strategies from biennials. I mean, we sit in here next to Unlimited, and Unlimited, in a way, is uh, uh, what the Harald Zeman 1997 Lyon Biennial looked like. Very much it's, so, yeah. uh, it's based on this idea of a vast space with large works, uh, with cubes sort of dividing the space. And uh, you now, uh, which is quite interesting, I think we have come, or many of us were in Documenta, and uh, now we come here, and, and Jens has just curated a section called Parkour, which um, has a, a, a sort of, uh, it's an exhibition, it's supported by a fair, but it's uh, also a reflection on site-specific works, uh, which uh, I think, and I'm not saying just to be nice, in many ways is also more complex than some pieces we have seen in Documenta where the choice of spaces seemed completely random and unrelated to works. So I think um, there is a constant now cannibalization between the two uh, models, which, uh, um, Unfortunately, I think puts more pressure and negative pressure on the exhibitions because uh, biennials don't have the money the fairs have and, um, and cannot compete on the same ground. And maybe that's also um, something worth thinking about, that maybe it's about changing the ground <laughs> rather than changing the show. But um, I don't have an answer. I don't that. know how much this is really a question of, of um, support, financial support, whether or, you know, the, but, but um, I think that many of the fairs sort of like said, okay, we don't only need to display, we don't only need to be in a marketplace, but we can also be cultural producers by having sections like Art Parkour or um, the talk series here, and, you know, F Freeze Fair does their own thing, and Arco does their own thing, and all the other wonderful fairs do their own thing. Uh, in, in relation to that, but there's certainly often a confusion about what is the difference between a fair, uh, you know, which is of course a marketplace, and a, a biennial, which is supposed to be much more of a sort of, you know, curatorial, carefully constructed curatorial argument. Um, but I think we sort of um, come to the end of our time, and um, I was hoping that we could perhaps uh, have some contributions from the audience if you have any questions regarding our conversation or also the magazine, please feel free to ask. And there's a microphone um, that is coming around. So if you have any questions, uh, now is a good time. Is there any questions, comments? No. Don't be shy. <laughs> Sorry?
There's a question here. No, uh, no but comment. A, a comment. No, no. No, okay, sorry. There's one here. Oh, now three questions. Finally. <laughs> I should have planted some people there. <laughs> um, well, since we're talking about the sort of merger of the intention of biennials and the intention of art fairs, can you talk about funding? It sort of seems like there's a lot of the same sources are being approached for funding of non-commercial and commercial ventures. Uh, well, the, what I know is that usually biennials are very poor. <laughs> so it's, uh, um, and unfortunately, they become more so. And uh, that has resulted in uh, um, sometimes uh, curators and artists also relying on the support of galleries in a way that it's uh, uh, similar to, uh, to what happens here. I think it's... Um, um, it's difficult. No? I think that yeah. every biennial has a different funding structure. Yeah. Uh, I mean, in, for example, the last biennial that I was working on is the, uh, in Istanbul. Uh, gets a lot of money from the uh, Istanbul Foundation for Arts and Culture, but at the same time, there's also a lot of money that is uh, being raised through uh, international foundations uh, that support artists from particular countries, and of course, also a lot of corporate sponsorship. That makes a lot of sense on that scale when you have a biennial that has maybe two to three hundred thousand visitors and offers these corporations a lot of uh, visibility. But um, of course there's also other sort of perhaps more complex um, uh, relationships where an artist has a particular idea for a piece, the, the work to produce costs maybe fifty thousand dollars and after the by end of the biennial the gallery is selling the piece for maybe four or five times this amount of money. So often there's negotiations between the biennial, the curators, and the galleries to find uh, some compromise in terms of how to uh, produce these um, works. Yeah, it's. Uh, <clears throat> I mean, it's a it's a difficult topic because um, ultimately it's. Uh, I think it's also the responsibility of the curator to sort of make sure that. Um, the biennial or the exhibition doesn't become uh, a vitrine for goods for sales, which, uh, of course, I mean, I, I don't want to be naive, and uh, I'm fully aware that things also are produced and shown uh, in biennials, and then they end up sold. But I think uh, that has resulted also in a certain aesthetic of biennials that uh, I find a bit problematic, because, uh, um, and this is quite, uh, very much a sort of insider's discussion. But uh, what happens is that it's always easier to find money to produce new works uh, because there is an invested interest from the artist and the gallerist uh, because they will be able to sell it after the show. But that ends up in, in exhibitions being made of works that often have no relationship to each other, uh, that have uh, a sort of, uh, in which works are sort of struggling to capture the attention of clients, and I think in a way has made uh, curatorial practice a little weaker and, and more superficial. On the other hand, I mean, my problem is if I want to borrow a work from a museum, it's more difficult, or from a private collector, it's more difficult to find money for that because uh, nobody has an interest in helping me <laughs> get uh, a specific work that it's not going to go for sale. And so I think that's uh, uh, maybe I'm just. Uh, obsessed with this thought because that's a limit that I see within Biennals, but I think it's uh, something to keep in mind and, and something that has changed uh, the way in which Biennals are built. For example, just by putting each artist in a room because then you don't even have to worry about what he or she will do. And, um, you know, this idea of the, the Biennial as a free for all, which I think is less interesting, but it's quite effective from an economical point of view. You know? There are two more questions. I think we still have time for questions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, could you, you spoke about the idea of um, biennials being sponsored by institutions and then maybe privately or... Um, so could you speak about the idea of national pavilions and the curatorial production or creative production of when they're controlled by independent curators versus, say, a national museum and the output that they produce? I guess. Can you, can you repeat that? Uh, well, going to the Venice Biennale and seeing the difference between the curatorial practices between each national pavilion, and they're all independent, or each, each country is responsible for their own output, but within that, 
their decisions between what is put on display in the national pavilions, whether it's independently curated or pri privately done by a gallery, versus public institutions? And can you discuss basically your opinions of the output curatorially? And well, um, I'm not sure. Just um, answer the part that you understood. <laughs> <laughs> no, because no, I just want to clarify, there is no such a thing as a national pavilion curated privately by a gallery. It doesn't exist. I mean, the, uh, to, to also clarify something, because it's uh, uh, also s uh, something that it's very peculiar to the Venice Biennial, which is now the only Biennial that still has national pavilions. Uh, the director of the um, Venice Biennial uh, is actually responsible for curating what it's called the international show, which is usually taking place in the international pavilion, the big one in the center of the Giardini, and in the Arsenale. Then all the national pavilions are uh, directly um, managed either by uh, ministries of respective countries, and in some cases it's the Minister of Culture, in others foreigner ministry, or by uh, institutions that are created specifically to handle uh, the organization of, uh, uh, of a pavilion. Then each nation handles the, the selection of the pavilion artists in different ways. Some are um, appointed directly by a committee, others uh, they are chosen by a process of selection. Um, in some cases, the curator is chosen, and then the curator chooses the artist, or in other cases, uh, the, the artist is chosen, and the artist chooses a curator to work with, and so on and so forth. Uh, but there is no such a thing as a privately run national pavilion. Uh, and, um, and I think, I mean, the, the national pavilion is, a, in a way, is an anachronistic uh, concept. On the other, what we are witnessing in Venice is that the more global the world becomes, the more nations want to participate, which is also uh, quite interesting, and it seems to have been to be a trend that uh, we have seen uh, developing from the 90s onwards. Sometimes, you know, to the to the explosion of the global culture, there is also a, an explosion of local pride and, in some cases, nationalism. And, um, so even though it's an anachronistic model, it's a model that uh, many nations want to continue. And, uh, and you know, who are we to decide if it's anachronistic or not? And it's a model that I think it's also, even though quite strange, and it, it makes me think of that game, what is it called, Risk, where all the nations attack each other. But it's, a, um, it's what makes also that exhibition completely unique and, and what it ties it back to a history of 110 years. So. There were a number of other biennials that for a while had national yeah. pavilions or what they called national representation. And Sao Paulo was one of the uh, few remaining ones, I think, that um, were bringing in still national representations. But Venice is the last one that sort of has hold on to that model. Yeah. Nevertheless, I know this from my own experience from working on other biennials. There's still a very strong interest of many countries to send artists from their country to large-scale uh, biennials and fund those participations, um, even though it doesn't happen officially under the umbrella of a national pavilion or national um, participation. Um, I think that there was once the idea in Venice, um, and that's probably impossible to realize, that the, 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 the concept of the international exhibition, which uh, Maurizio uh, Massimiliano is now uh, <laughs> curating, uh, would be um, taken over also by the national pavilions to a certain degree, so that there would be an overarching concept, not only for the international show, but also for the national pavilions. But I suppose it's uh, well, extremely in, difficult yeah, to realize. In terms of time, is the, the uh, the curator who's chosen to do the Biennale um, doesn't have enough time to influence or to recommend the theme to no. the rest of the pavilions <coughs> because in some cases they've started the selection independently before. Uh, I think we have to stop unless there is a... One more question? One more. There yeah. was one here. Maybe two. I think someone is very desperate now. All of a sudden. <laughs> I'm Barbara Strebel. I have a question about the local and global. Um, I've been a witness of how this is happening in Basel for the last 25 years, and I think rather than fostering the creative potential in Basel, it somehow cripples it and stagnates it, actually, because everyone becomes a servicer to the international art world rather than... And 
I just wanted to talk about that, how that cross-pollination should actually happen and not just in moments and then and one of the crass examples, I must say, is I went to the Art Parcours and on the map, point number three, unfortunately, is temporarily a Fixelstöble. And I think that this is supposed to be an integration project. And I was a witness that I was actually said, you look at the description number three, if everyone reads it. And unfortunately, it was a Fixelstöble and children were there. I mean, heroin addicts are shooting up there in your project on the map. I don't really understand. Number three on your map yeah. is a temporary use of a heroin addict. Right now, at this moment, this has been printed, and I witnessed it, and I think it's probably been closed down since. But your number three in your project, read it, and go and see what it is in reality. Well, I've been there many times. I haven't really seen any um, heroin addicts around number three. There well, look is at your a map. hospital. Look at your map. Yeah, I look at my map, OK. I don't understand the question. I don't really understand. Uh, Maybe one more question. Um, well, um, my question, um, what well, we said that uh, the biennials are international and global shows. Also my question concerned the connection to the local environment. And so I was wondering what it means um, to curate show, cur uh, curating shows in so different places like Venice and, or New York or Istanbul. Yes. Well, I think what makes Venice really special when you think about the exhibition there is that there's not any kind of contemporary local art scene that you sort of like have to think about, have to take into your consideration. Whereas when we did, for example, Istanbul, there's a, a very big um, local art scene, which meant that we had to somehow think about how to engage with this and uh, go and meet with lots of uh, the, the local cultural producers, whether these are artists or writers or filmmakers, um, also go and meet with other curators. But in our case, when we did this, it was sort of a, a, a stimulation. It helped us to define what is necessary or what do we feel could happen here in, in Istanbul uh, while we are working on this exhibition. Um, I don't know how this is for you in Venice, but there isn't yeah. actually any sort of like local context that is um, it's a bit of an off situation in Venice. Yeah, I mean, the, the Venice is uh, the context of no context. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, uh, it's, it's quite, but that is sometimes also liberating. I, I've done biennials in, in places where the context is everything. Like, for example, uh, Manifesta, I, I curated the edition that was in San Sebastian. So in the Basque region and everybody, the moment you say Basque thinks of uh, independent uh, struggles and terrorism, et cetera, et cetera. So everything was uh, read through that lens. And actually, we had to struggle to, to sort of break away from that context. I think Venice and Kassel are these two places where uh, somehow the discourse on the local gets abandoned. Or in uh, Kassel is always uh, the local as the history of Germany and the war. And uh, in Venice, instead, because it's such a fantasy, that place, it, it gets uh, it sort of disappears in the background. I think, I mean, it's interesting, many biennials in the last 20 years have sort of addressed the issue of site specificity in different ways. And uh, the, the most recent example is uh, Manifesta, which is quite brilliant in the way that it's a show taking place in a mine and uh, basically talks about coal. And, uh, um, and I think, I mean, what I don't like is when the site becomes a sort of fetish so that the whole show has to engage with the, um, with the local. Um, because I always think also we go to exhibitions to go away from where we come from and uh, not just to, to see over and over again the place where we live. So. I think we have to stop. I think, yeah. So uh, thank you very much for coming. And there's uh, some more issues here for you to um, take away. Thank you very much. And thank you. Thank you.